Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. Now today we're going to be talking about the different types of superchargers that are available and hopefully we'll shine a little bit of light on what those differences are and why one particular style of supercharger may be better suited to a certain application than another. It's one of those situations where there really is no perfect answer and there's a fair bit to take in before you can make a really informed decision. So before we get into that though, just covering off a few few things that have been going on around here over the last week or so. Now if you've been following us you'll know that we have been furiously working away on our FDRX7 project and uh, as a result actually of some information that we posted in our last pre-show we got some comments on our YouTube channel about our drive-by-wire throttle conversion and uh, this is a little bit problematic on the FDRX7 just by because of the design of the throttle body itself as well as the upper inlet manifold. It doesn't really lend itself that well to easily adapting up a normal uh, off-the-shelf drive-by-wire throttle body from the likes of maybe an LS2 or something similar. Uh, just to show you what that all looks like if you aren't a rotary fanatic, let's head across to my laptop screen. Uh, so this is the throttle body off the FD RX7 uh, and as you can see it's got three throttle plates in there and interestingly enough for some reason I'm holding that upside down just to confuse matters a little bit. Uh, so normally at the top we've got our two throttle plates and at the bottom we've got our single throttle plate which feeds into the primary runners. So it's a little bit complicated uh, to understand better how that all fits So we'll just jump across and have a look at the upper inlet manifold. So uh, the three holes that we've got here understandably made up nicely with those three butterflies in the throttle body. Uh, now the design of this engine obviously it comes out of the 90s there wasn't uh, the same sort of technology available back then as what we've got now so in an interesting twist Mazda chose to fit a set of uh, second throttle butterflies in the upper inlet manifold and this was actuated based on some operating conditions and essentially uh, when the engine was cold these were predominantly closed not all the way closed but predominantly closed and it was kind of like Mazda's way of limiting how much fun you could have with your your stone cold engine when you first started it up. With us though we have a little bit more flexibility now and of course because we own this car we're not going to be thrashing it when it's stone cold so we're going to actually be removing those secondary butterflies back there. It's been shown that there can be some very small but measurable improvement in airflow as a result of getting those out of the way. So the problem comes that we can't easily adapt a single throttle body up to the system. There are a few ways of doing it and I know there are people who have run the likes of an LS drive-by-wire throttle body straight onto the upper inlet manifold. Uh, but what we're actually toying with at the moment is the idea of adapting a remote drive-by-wire throttle actuator to run the factory throttle body. And that might sound like a bit of a weird setup with a bit more complexity, but it's actually not out of the usual. Uh, many OE manufacturers do this. Uh, BMW, with the likes of their S54 engine and the BMW E46 M3, uh, they also did this in their E60 M5, the V10. Uh, they were running individual throttle bodies on those engines and used a remote actuator mounted uh, to run a the bell crank style individual throttle body. So uh, what we're going to consider doing, and I don't don't really know if this is something we're going to be doing uh, straight away uh, but there are a couple of options here so I'll head across to my laptop screen and this one here is actually an aftermarket actuator uh, that is available out of Gen V in the UK. Uh, pretty pricey though so that's kind of put me off as well particularly when we convert uh, UK British pounds into New Zealand dollars it's a little bit scary. Uh, probably a cheaper and easier alternative is the BMW variant so that's something we're probably going to have a bit of a play around with. As I say, don't quite know if we're going to be getting that going for uh, our initial startup, but uh, we can run it with the cable throttle. We're going to be wiring up for the required outputs and inputs for the drive-by-wire setup, so relatively pain-free to convert over to drive-by-wire at a later point. Probably the biggest hassle factor for us will actually be finding a mounting location uh, for the actuator as well as, of course, we're going to need to match that with the drive-by-wire accelerator pedal. So a little bit to think about but probably not uh, our biggest consideration right now. 
Uh, now, another thing I wanted to talk about here, this is something that uh, I've mentioned a couple of times in some of our webinars, and uh, we actually had one of our members uh, email in asking for a little bit more clarity around this. And this is the concept of exhaust manifold back pressure. So I've talked about this in our webinars on turbo dynamics and turbo performance, measuring turbo performance. And for me, it's one of the metrics that I use when I'm looking at uh, the turbo sizing, how well I've sized the turbocharger to suit uh, the particular engine that we're running it on. And of course again there is no magic number here that uh, every turbo installation should have in terms of exhaust back pressure. But what we do is we sort of tend to choose a turbocharger that's going to provide less back pressure if we are prepared to give away some low RPM performance in turn in turn to gain high RPM performance. Perfect application for that would be in a drag car where we're really only operating across a very narrow RPM range right at the top of the engine's rev range and we don't really care about boost response down low. We're going to probably be using a two-step launch control strategy to build boost on the line and provided the car goes down the track straight and the driver can stay in the throttle, essentially it's always going to be on boost for the moment we drop the clutch and leave the starting line. On the other hand, that combination is not going to work very well for a street car where we are much more interested in good punchy response and low RPM boost response. Uh, that's going to make for a much more fun car to drive than one that may make quite a lot more power but doesn't make full boost until we get to 7000 RPM. Not very usable on the street. So the term that we look at there or the metric that we're looking at is the comparison between our inlet manifold pressure and our exhaust gas back pressure. So the the point that I've made several times now is particularly if we are looking at a high powered drag car, uh, what we're generally looking for is not always going to be the case but uh, a really good turbo sizing in my opinion is where we can get to a position where our exhaust manifold back pressure is actually lower than our inlet manifold pressure. Now when we get to that situation we've got a situation where essentially the uh, engine starts almost acting a little bit like a naturally aspirated engine and this allows us the potential to to run uh, cams with a larger duration. Uh, this, the reason why we won't run really large cams on a smaller turbo setup is because when we've got a lot of exhaust gas back pressure and we've got a lot of overlap, uh, what we end up with is the exhaust gas back pressure is higher than the inlet manifold pressure so we can end up with the exhaust gases basically making their way back into the combustion chamber and this displaces room that could be taken up for a fresh charge of air. Of course exhaust gas is inert uh, so that's not really going to be doing anything for our power. On the other hand when our inlet manifold pressure is higher than our exhaust manifold pressure that's not the situation we've got and uh, we can take advantage of some of the sort of uh, ram effect of getting more air into the engine with a uh, different cam style. So this comes down to one of the problems is that uh, how we go about actually measuring our exhaust gas back pressure because obviously uh, we're talking about a fairly harsh environment in the exhaust manifold or the turbo uh, exhaust housing and that doesn't really stand up too well if we're going to go and fit a sensor directly into that area. So what instead we do is we use a remote mounted sensor. Uh, this is actually one of the exhaust manifold back pressure sensors that is going on our FDRX7 and this particular canister here is is a product made by Full Function Engineering. All it is is a damper to take out some of the spiking nature of the pulsing that we generally see in our exhaust back pressure trace and we've got a 150 psi uh, Honeywell sensor fitted to that. Now the problem is we need to get rid of some of the heat before the exhaust gas makes its way to that chamber and to show you how that kind of looks we'll just head across to my laptop screen for a moment and uh, this is a car that I shot a picture of, took a picture of when we were at TX2K just showing the integration of that exhaust back pressure sensor. So we can see that the sensor is actually being taken straight off the exhaust housing here on this precision turbocharger and we've got a short run of tubing and the bending in that tube tubing there uh, just is used to help get rid of that heat before it makes its way into the little canister there, that little damper. So that helps uh, make sure that our sensor is going to live a long and healthy life. We're going to get a nice smooth uh, exhaust back pressure signal that's going to actually be useful to us. So to have a look and see what that looks like we'll just have a quick look at some i2 logging from, this is one of our test cars, our Toyota 86. Now it's not a very exciting car, it does uh, only run a factory engine so we aren't 
running a lot of boost on this setup. It's running an EFR 6758 turbocharger, but just to show you here, uh, at the top we've got our purple trace, which is our RPM. This is a ramp run on our dyno. We've got our throttle position just to show what's going on there. And the two pieces of information that we're interested in here, in red we've got our inlet manifold pressure, and in orange we've got our exhaust gas back pressure. So at the start of the run we can see our exhaust gas back pressure, in this case sitting at about 97 kPa. Uh, we're a little bit high in altitude here, so that's why we're a bit below our, our normal 100 kPa sort of target that we'd expect to see. Uh, we see our boost pressure comes up to, in this case, around about 160 kPa. At the start of our run, 3,900 RPM, We've got about 21 kPa of positive exhaust manifold back pressure. So this is great at this point. Our exhaust manifold back pressure is lower than our inlet manifold pressure. However, we get to a crossover point up here at around about 6300 RPM. Uh, that's where our exhaust manifold back pressure and inlet manifold pressure are equal. And then right in the higher revs, we see that our exhaust manifold back pressure climbs just a little bit. We've got about 185 kPa uh, versus 163 kPa. Not actually a bad sized turbo per, for this particular application. Uh, we've got a little bit more exhaust back pressure, but uh, that's not a bad setup because in this case being a streetcar we really want that low RPM response so really need to understand that the uh, turbocharger uh, in order to get snappy response it does need to be provided exhaust gas energy in terms of both heat and flow and uh, to harness that the essences that is going to provide some restriction to that flow that's why we see that exhaust gas back pressure uh, but uh, one of the questions we got is why can, how can we have our exhaust manifold back pressure being lower than our inlet manifold pressure it's all about understanding uh, the four strokes of the the four stroke engine principle uh, the inlet the uh, compression the power and the exhaust stroke and understanding where the valves are open and closed in those instances and uh, how how the cycles are separated all right, so moving on, uh, I just wanted to also talk a little bit about some components for our Nissan 350Z project, which unfortunately, since Zach has left at the beginning of the year, has been sitting pretty much unloved. It's not a situation we're super stoked about, and we will be getting back into that, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. But things have been progressing a little bit as well. Uh, here on the bench in front of me, I've got our Garrett GTX uh, turbocharger that's going on that. That's a 3076 Gen 2. And uh, we've also got a locally manufactured uh, exhaust manifold. This comes from Cinco Customs here in New Zealand. So this is a thick wall Schedule 10 stainless steel tubing. So hopefully uh, it's going to be pretty resilient and crack free. Now the reason I wanted to show you this is because uh, Cinco make an off the shelf product for the Nissan S chassis which obviously normally comes out with the SR20 in it. Of course we've done an engine swap here, we've put the SR20 VVL uh, engine combination uh, into our 350Z chassis and we weren't 100% certain that the off the shelf S chassis manifold was going to fit. So what happened was that Cinco sent us down a basic manifold that was just jigged up and we got to have a play around and make sure that that was going to fit. Actually it did fit really well with the exception of the wastegate. Uh, the wastegate ended up basically pointing straight at the uh, passenger side strut tower so that wasn't going to work too well for us. So the fabrication shop that was doing the work for us, they went and relocated the wastegate and tacked it all up. We sent that through to Cinco. I actually hadn't had a very good look at it but uh, Cinco got on the phone to us and pointed out something that I just wanted to mention. This is something that's really often overlooked with exhaust manifold design for turbocharged engines, and that is the integration of the wastegate with the exhaust manifold. So in essence, what we need to understand is that exhaust gas is really lazy and it doesn't like changing direction. So in order to get good flow out of the wastegate, it's important to make sure that the integration is smooth and that the exhaust gas doesn't need to make any sharp turns or go back on itself and uh, as delivered that was a problem we had with this uh, the way the the wastegate had been tacked on and let's just see if we can switch over to our iPhone here and I'll try and explain this uh, yeah I think that'll probably work um, the way the wastegate had been integrated in here uh, basically it had been taken off one runner 
obviously hadn't been uh, cut a hole into it, but it, it had been located here on this runner. Now, instead of coming off the collector, obviously it's only going to get flow from this one runner. That's not going to work out too well. And what we're almost certainly going to see if we'd gone with that setup would be that uh, the boost would climb sky high and would have no control over it at high RPM. So instead, what we talked through was basically just tacking everything up, which is what Synco have done here. So we can see now, hopefully you can see into there, uh, we have got the wastegate coming straight off the collector. It's going to have a good shot flow from all four of the runners. We'll see if we can see in there. Probably pretty dark, but that's basically what we're looking at. And uh, that leaves us with a little bit of work to do here though. Uh, what we're going to need to do is finish off and uh, get the mounting for that wastegate sorted out uh, and welded up. So this is, as I've said, something that I see done incorrectly so often. And it's really frustrating because essentially there's nothing we can do electronically to lower the boot down and you're going to get this exponential effect where as we go higher in the RPM the boost just starts to skyrocket. Now of course that can also be incredibly dangerous to your engine. Uh, even if your boost is staying within your absolute upper maximum uh, and you can tune it, it's going to give a really horrible torque curve to the engine and we get to the situation where we've got no way of reducing the engine torque at high RPM because we're stuck with that boost pressure. Uh, so that that's just something that's really easy to fix at the design stage but if you overlook that and you've got a complete turbo setup it's much much harder to fix later on. Right, uh, I don't think I've actually brought that up, just give me a second and I will though. Uh, while I'm doing this I will just mention we are still running our Wiseco Piston giveaway. So if you haven't got your name into the draw yet, you've still got the chance to do that. I'll get the team to chuck a link in that you can follow. Uh, if you want to get your name into that draw, you're going to have the opportunity to win uh, a set of any of Wiseco's shelf stock pistons. So this covers just about any popular engine you could imagine. So whatever it is, and those will be shipped anywhere in the world, you'll also get our suite of engine building courses so that you'll know what to do with your fresh forged Wiseco pistons. Uh, now I don't think that giveaway has got long to run either so if you are interested make sure you jump on that. There are a few other activities you can do uh, that will give you more entries into the drawer as well so make sure you give yourself the best chance possible. Right lastly for today as well we have just launched our latest video today which is a tech tour of the English Racing slash ETS uh, Mitsubishi e Evo 10 uh, currently holds the world record as the fastest Mitsubishi Evo 10. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what the uh, mile an hour is on that car right now. Uh, but producing around about 1170 horsepower, 53 psi of boost. The Evo 10 is a platform that probably hasn't been jumped on as quickly as the earlier model Evos in terms of drag racing. In particular there are a few negatives with the Evo 10 platform there to make it a little bit more challenging than the earlier Evo 7, 8, 9 for example. The alloy block 4B11 while uh, definitely a superior engine in terms of airflow particularly with the, the uh, variable cam control and the 4B11 cylinder head, you've got the problem that we are dealing with an aluminium engine block and when we're starting to run the sort of boost levels that you need to make 11, 12, 1300 horsepower, obviously an alloy block is not quite as strong as the earlier cast iron block. Uh, there is also the inherent problems with trying to get this sort of power through a predominantly factory drivetrain as well, and also lastly the fact that the Evo 10 is significantly heavier and larger uh, than the earlier Evo. So anyway, we talk with Miles Pilot of this particular car and find out what exactly they've done to make this car so fast and where they see it going to in the future. So make sure you head across to our YouTube channel, check that video out. While you're at it, make sure you subscribe. That way you'll start to date with all our latest videos as soon as we release them. All right, give me a second here and we'll get started with today's webinar.